I know typically in recruiting, the fruits of a season's success probably aren't felt until the next year, in this case, class of 2025. But how much easier is it just when you're on the road talking to kids than when you've actually got tangible results rather than your first year when you're selling a vision? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I always said we had to have uh, – our team had to have confidence without evidence, and our staff had to have the same. That when they went on the road, they had to sell – uh and tell and really give the messaging of who and what we are now our first year we didn't have a recruiting class so um we only were able to sign two players that's all they had scholarship wise when we arrived so our first recruiting class was 22 um which was probably the best class historically arizona ever had and then last year's class we were able to build off of that and then this year's class has been really a unique blend of uh we don't have a lot of numbers we only have about you know, 25 scholarships available, including the transfers, because all of our 22s, uh, no one went in the portal. We didn't lose any players. So um, and we signed a big class the last two years. Coach, when you arrived at uh, Arizona, it was during a time in which it started to feel like or people were would feel like that this is a program that you just can't win at for whatever reason. Um, there was a class before you arrived that didn't have a single top 1000 player in the rankings. Uh, I think there might've been one at the end when they, they did an update, uh, the update to those rankings. And it was just kind of one of those deals of like, what is wrong there? And then you show up and you just seem to get what Arizona was about immediately. Um, you spoke their language and you understood the exact formula, the areas to recruit, the way to embrace it, bring in Gronkowski back for the spring, all the things that you did as a first year head coach, um, how do you learn that language and how did you find yourself to be prepared enough to at least understand what needed to be done before it was done to fix Arizona's problems? Yeah. You know, even though I was a first year head coach, I've been around a lot of head coaches and I've been in six different programs, maybe even seven uh, in the first year of a program. So Pete Carroll's first year in Seattle, Jim Harbaugh's first year of Michigan, uh, Gus Bradley's first year in Jacksonville. So when you start doing all the first years, you start mm -hmm. realizing like, okay, what is it going to take? You know, what does it look like? What do you need to do? Um, and you look at where the successes came from and uh, you take those notes and you really just say, all right, you know, we've got to ingratiate ourselves in the community. We've got to make sure that it doesn't matter what people thought of the hire. It doesn't matter that we didn't go to school here. You know I mean? If that was the case, then Nick Saban could only be the head coach at Kent State, right? And, you know, Bill Belichick could only coach at Wellesleyan. So we know that that's not true, but yet there's always that initial, you know, stigma you got to get over. And um, our philosophy was we're going to hire a great staff that understands the West Coast and understands uh, what it comes down to. And I, I felt like it was necessary to put guys like Ricky Hundley and Chuck Cecil on the coaching staff early. Uh, ingratiate and bring in Teddy Bruschi and Gronk to certain events and uh, really see like, okay, let's reach out to the past, but never, you know, say that we're not going to move forward into the future. How much do you anticipate your recruiting focus switching from Southern California, where you look at your quarterback and your wide receiver T-Mac, we, we all know where those guys came from to Texas. Now that you guys are going to the big 12. I would assume we're going to remain 80% Southern California. Uh, I see it as a huge advantage that those other programs have to travel all the way to the East Coast to play football games and play games in the cold and play games and, you know, go go to Rutgers and go to Penn State and go to Champaign, Illinois. And uh, I mean, who's our major competition in recruiting? The two programs on the West Coast on, on California that now have to convince kids that it's worth their while to go play at Iowa uh, and go play at Illinois uh, where I can, you know, tell these kids, Hey, you guys all think as California kids, uh, you're better football players than Texas high school kids. Well, let's see it. And, you know, Florida high school kids, well, let's go do it. So we get our road games are in Texas. Our road games are in Florida, you know, at central Florida next year. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll mix the Kansas in there or not, but you go to Kansas and you're talking about, um, uh, Maybe take a tour Allen Fieldhouse or something, you know, make it make it something special rather than just go to some of those other programs in Southern California that they're going to play against. 
Jen, when you were, you've had a lot of success this year, and I don't know how much you spend time reading coaching carousel rumors and all that stuff, but your name comes up quite a bit when it pertains to potentially being a candidate at other at other positions. Um, you know, Mitch asked you a little bit about how recruiting goes when you've had a lot of success, but when you've had a lot of success to this degree, this quickly, it turns into those other things too. How have you been able to balance? Um, recruiting to your program while also, you know, reportedly being a candidate for a lot of big time jobs that will either be open now or next year. Yeah. Well, the good part is uh, I had zero focus on other jobs this year. I did not, uh, that did not even, you know, cross, cross the line other than people su- suggesting that I would be a good candidate for those jobs. Um, uh, you know, I feel like I'm fully committed uh, to the kids that fully committed to me. Uh, which was in 2022 when we were one and eleven, and you know Jaden Delora and Noah Fafita both chose to come here. T Mac and Jacob Cowan both came chose to come here. One as a transfer, one as a you know mm-hmm. uh, freshman. Uh, Jonah Sevenay as a freshman, Jordan Morgan as a senior decided to come back. And when you start at Jonah Coleman and Mike Wiley, and when you look at that, I said, "There's no way I'm going to go look at another job this year." Uh, and then our athletic director and president have worked very hard to. Um, hopefully put a uh, contract in place that, you know, keeps me here a long time. Uh, that's our, that's our hope and our plan as we move into the start of the year. And, um, you know, the other things are nice compliments, but that's about it. The talk around the sport now is the recruiting calendar and how hectic December is. It's obviously true, but with most of the kids taking official visits in June and, and most teams have 80, you know, 80, 85% of their class wrapped up uh, by the start of the season, how much recruiting are, act- are you actually doing in December versus portal work? And, and how has that kind of played out for you? Yeah, we have to change this calendar. This calendar is not a sustainable model for family life, personal life, professional life, football life. Um, it, it just doesn't work right now with the idea of, you know, the day, you, day after you play your last game. Now you're on the road trying to make sure people don't poach. Uh, your high school recruits that are all planning on signing December 20th. Then each day you see another portal entry, but you want to make sure your team doesn't go into the portal. So you're talking to them yet. You want to have a great bowl game. Uh, So you're game planning and making sure that you do a great job of keeping your team together. And then, you know, now you've got star players from other teams leaving right before their bowl game. So they go play 12 games and now they're not playing in the 13th and, it just doesn't feel right to me. Um, it feels like we have to come up with a better plan, a way to either discourage portal entries in December or let people sign when they commit rather than wait till December 20th. You know, so then maybe you don't have to spend as much time on the road trying to make sure no one else is stealing them. Um, but we need to figure out a little bit better of an overall structure in college football so we can have some – you know, some life, uh, some life as coaches, some life as players, because I don't think it's fair to anybody right now. Coach, I know it's, it's funny that you just mentioned a few of those things, um, you know, in terms of the challenges that you face inherently that maybe coaches five years ago wouldn't have had to face, whether it be trying to retain your roster or trying to keep kids from flipping and, you know, also being on the offensive to make the best roster you possibly can. Um, the thing that I think is most interesting about your build is, um, a lot of the players that you guys recruited and hit on hit big and you hit on them um, against other, you know, programs that probably would have won those recruiting battles before your arrival. What does it say about your culture? I read a quote about you wanting to take care of your assistants before yourself. Uh, The atmosphere that you've created in Arizona that has kind of kept U of A out of the, you know, well, our quarterbacks leaving or our star receivers were leaving, you know, NIL is a big part of this too. Like, what have you done at U of A to continue to foster that environment where people want to stay and and try to build this thing with you? Yeah, you know, our goal has been, like, how can we be unique? How can we do it differently? Because we're not going to be able to outbid teams. Uh, We just don't have that those type of resources. We're not going to be able to, um, you know, talk point to all these championships that we've had in the past. Um, So our, our philosophy is, you know, how do we build a culture around people, you know, make our culture around people and, um, you know, evaluate well, 
under, uh, bring players and coaches in that have done it at the highest level. Make sure that uh, our kids get access to NFL coaches that no one else gets access to. Bring guys like Bill Belichick and Pete Carroll and Sean McVay and Zach Taylor on our campus um, as you know, friends of our program. Uh, be able to allow guys to be able to see and hear from guys that have won Super Bowls like Brian Billick and Mike Smith and Mike Shanahan and be able to say, well, maybe I won't get X, Y, Z, but I'm going to get opportunities that I won't get anywhere else. And our coaches feel the same way. Uh, Coach Belichick met with our whole defensive staff after practice one time and ran a three-hour staff meeting on, on the practice tape. I don't think you're going to get that in other places. I think the idea that we're able to keep our coaches and keep our players taken care of, it's also because we want them to be, grow as coaches. I want to see them become the best coach, the best player we can be. And uh, there's a huge value to that. And uh, we just kind of win with sincerity, I believe. Well, Coach, uh, we just wanted to congratulate you on a wonderful season. It looks like that program is headed in a really great direction. And, you know, expanded playoffs are on the horizon and a lot of exciting things, too. And it looks like your team is going to be well built here into the future. Uh, for Mitch, I just wanted to say thank you very much for joining us. It was super insightful and and really glad to have you on today. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. And I think we got 15 returning starters next year. So hopefully we can keep it rolling.